what you're looking at here is a Ferguson Video Star 3V22 VHS video recorder. This is one of the first generation of VHS video recorders to be available in the UK. It's not the very first one, but it's it's very similar in appearance and uh, it's kind of an updated version of it. Um, I bought this, I've got a pair of them um, and I'll look at the other one in another video. But this one's a bit more tatty looking than the other one. Um, see it's got a bit of a dent here. Uh, this pause button's a little bit bent and it's got a foot, it's got a foot missing. Um, I'll power it up, see what happens. I can hear a noise coming from inside. Cassette lamp's not come on. Uh, what mode are we in? Are we in timer mode? In video. Switch that off, I can hear something fizzing inside. It doesn't sound very good. Um, I'll open it up and have a look, see what's going on. It's quite dusty inside. It's got one of them uh, PCB type head drums. Turn it on again. Seems to be coming from round here. So I think first thing to do is to track down what this noise, this fizzing noise is. You can see there where there should be a foot. It's been taken off like there's there's a ring where it's been. Have a little look under here, see what the belts are like. I see that there's one on the uh, the thingy belt there. There's uh, the like the belt on the top. Oh, belts are there. They don't seem that bad. Well, that one's a bit loose. That one, I suppose that one's a bit loose as well. But they're not. Uh, they haven't turned into glue. But no, they are a bit cracked, I can see. That's all black. It's quite mucky under here, like all this lot. It's like, all blimey. Got to stake that board. Look at this. It's like covered in soot or something. It's all black. wonder what that's from. Something exploded. It's kind of emanating from around here. Well, that's where it's centered. Something caught fire in here or something. In a bit of a state, isn't it? I'll close this back up and put that side panel back on. Take the side panel off, I mean. See that with that other the fact that there's two of them have gone from the same person and this one being in an awful condition and having bits missing. I wonder if they've been using bits off this one to fix the other one or something. I wonder if I'll find bits missing. But
Trying to see if there's uh, a capacitor in there, one of the mains filter capacitors. See some. See what's in there to be honest. I'll switch it on again and see what happens. The clock's not coming on now. It's 500 milliamp fuse. That's intact and 3.15 amp. So that's blown. And that only fuses on a uh, regulator board. So I'll replace that 3.15 amp fuse and see what happens. It'll probably blow again. It doesn't even look blown from here. Let me test it on its own. Ah. The fuse is intact. Maybe it's just the bad con maybe it's just bad contact then. Test it again. Just be like bad contact or something. I'll clean it. Yeah, making contact now. I'll switch it back on. Still not coming on like test some voltages. I should have 18 volts here. I've got nothing. 12 volts, nothing. AC in from transformer. Doesn't seem to be anything. So maybe it's earlier, like right at the beginning. It's a dodgy socket. So if I hold that in that position, that starts to come on. Hmm. It seems it might be like it looks like it's a dodgy main socket. Right, main sockets here. Um, I've got to sort of put it on its side. I can't put it on its front to uh, for you to see it because they're all switches so why am I screwed in tight like that I don't know if I can get this out without taking that back plate off I'll see whether I can or not hmm that looks alright where does it go then? Yeah, 
Now, this is a plug that came with it, and you can see it's kind of melted. So I'll get a better lead and see what happens with that. Another lead. I know this one's alright. Oh, there's no fizzing noise now. And things on. So we just that lead. Blimey. Alright, try it again now. I don't like sat lamps on there. Let's try tight. See what happens. Might as well. It loads up and plays. I've connected it up to tally and see. I right, press play. See that picture sort of pulsating. That line that's going up, that's going that black line, that's not not really there that. It's just a, a thing at the camera. That one coming down is but well, drum servo's a bit dodgy. That's just a damaged bit of tape, that. I can see the take up's not running very well. Oop. I've stopped it because uh, the tape was spooling out into the machine. Picture's not too bad, but I can see there's like a bit of inversion in places, like round here. Not how well you can see it. It's not too bad, nah. When I first put it on, I'll get an inversion. Like you would get with uh, an FM problem or like worn heads. They don't look too bad now, but there's a bit of noise there. I'll clean, what I'll do is I'll clean heads and I'll put new belts on and then I'll try it again and see what it's like. And this is how I clean heads. I get a piece of sort of writing paper that I've cut to a strip uh, dip it in isopropyl alcohol and then just hold it flat to the heads and put my finger on where the actual head chips go and then just rotate it the heads do feel like maybe they're a bit worn not uh, not sticking out as much as like what they usually do. So maybe he's getting ready for a new ad. Uh, a lot of muck come off there. Be careful not to move the thing up and down when you uh, turn it. Don't move the paper up and down because you can damage ads. can see muck on the head drum still. So what I'm going to do now, I'm getting a cotton bud and I'm going to clean the drum but be very careful to avoid the actual head chips where they stick out which is where these screws are, that's where they're held in by these screws. Um, don't touch them with your cotton bud. I 
and I'll clean lower drum. Really, you want to clean the entire tape path. I need to take cassette housing out to do any further cleaning. And right, taking this out, you've got one, two, three, four screws. But you have to kind of be careful because it, it pops out. Um, when you remove it and there's belts in the way that you have to kind of navigate around and e even more so when you're putting it back in you end up putting it in knocking the belt off and then you have to take it back out again That's noisy, I think that, that head drum weren't spinning. I think something's come off. I pull the head belts come off. Uh, it's probably when I was turning thing. It's probably come off. Yeah, there it is. You can see this is the earlier version of the mechanism um, with this big belt there's a, a later version that's got like an extra pulley uh, an extra idler you don't get don't use this belt and what this black stuff is that why it's covered in this black stuff right, I'll take these belts off So if I'll give this a clean, I'll put belts back on. Right, I'll put these new belts on.
doing a lot of mucking and all, all this stuff. Probably do the overing and what it is. Metal dust or something, I don't know, it's weird. Changing belts. This is an awkward one. This Take this off a bit. I think. Got two of these belts in that belt kit for some reason. Unless one of them's for the other mechanism. Can't remember how many belts that has. I have a feeling it's got like a, a belt that's different from that this don't have, but I can't remember to be honest. Alright, that's the belts on. Let's have a look at this, see if I can bend it back into shape. Australia. Try tape, put this tape in.
taking the slack up so all the mechanical components that take up must be working alright in the suspension belt tape's gone back in properly Just put this in between that belt so you don't take it off. Uh, this little lever here needs to be pushed that way, and then this flap goes behind it. It's like a little spring that's pushing against it. That's all that the eject works. Right, try plate tape. That's not too bad actually. There's a bit of uh, twitching with drum servo, you can see it kind of growing and shrinking. It's a bit better than it was before though, so it's like if I mess about with tracking. That's in fixed position. I zoom in a bit. If you can so I do track it. I can sort of see a, a little bit of uh, like inversion where them uh, what do you call it are you know these diagonal black and white stripes sometimes it's only faint I'll have to have a look at FM output that's not too bad this is what it's like just playing the normal video you can still see servo uh, twitching a little bit I think this I don't have a tripod it's not moving because of like hand shaking this is a pretty good picture oh look at there's a capacitor in a uh, servo circuit that sometimes goes a bit dodgy um, I'll have a look at that, see if that needs replacing and then uh, have a go at setting drum servo up and this is the servo board it's also the audio board that capacitor is just here and it's this tantalum one here Test it. Hmm. I like pass it as fine, so I'll just put it back in and then I'll uh, try and set up the servo.
start setting up the servo now and do the discriminator first. There's a couple of different ways you can do this. Uh, there's one way where you supply a, a voltage to the drum and set it for uh, a certain reading. I can't remember off the top of my head exactly how you do it, but you, you have to kind of stop the drum by hand and stuff um, with the rest of the machine off. But the other way of doing it is to connect an 100 ohm resistor between test point 16 and 13. 13's like the, the ground point. A scope collector of transistor X9. Put it in play and pause and adjust the thing. So put it in play and pause. So what you do is you adjust this so it starts going like that. Right. Back it off. So it's just stable. That should be alright, I think. Uh, um, and then other one, the uh, I'm on the sampling position. Um, how you do that is you supply a signal to the machine in your scope test point nine, and. Uh, that gives you the the ramp, the servo ramp waveform, and uh, well, it's easier to just to just do it, and you'll see. You have to get a symmetrical uh, sort of overshoot. Right, so what I'm doing, I've got it in record, and I'm triggering from the video signal, and I'm sculpting that waveform at test point nine. So you, you see this, that's uh, the sampling point that's generated by the video signal coming in. So if you slow the drum down, like this uh, ramp, this sort of kind of trapeze wave, um, that's from the drum. So if I slow the drum down by hand, you can see it moves, gets longer, and uh, so what what you want is when I bring this to right up to end it uh, to end that flat bit. Well, it should do it. You see, when you bring it to here, you release it, it should go down here and about the same distance along the bottom and back up. And I think it comes up and then down. You see, that's gone over a few times.
So you adjust it to try and get it to do that, what I said. And this is R49. Yeah, I think that's it. I'll try it anyway, red tape. But the reason you put it you do it in record mode is the uh, the requirements at server are a lot more stringent in record. It needs to be uh, more exact. That like you could if you if you did it in play you could uh, have it set up so it were alright and it would work in play but then you try and record and it won't work right, well this is it now there's still a little bit of uh, sort of pumping at the picture look at that edge there it's not as bad as it were before the servo locks up pretty quickly if I stop it i start it Servo locks up as by the time the uh, picture comes on. And still, you can see there's still a little bit of movement though. Motor might be a uh, way out, maybe. You can see as well there's some uh, like inversion going on. You see here, uh, these horizontal like black dashes. And I'll have a look at the FM circuitry. Alright, well another fault seems to have developed. I'm looking here at a scope trace, uh, a colour bar signal being played back. And you can see that there is this chroma information there. It's a bit flickery and stuff, but that's fine. Um, but if we look at the TV, you see there's no colour. There's these horizontal lines flickering about. And it's not in the. Uh, there's a switch on back that switches it to black and white mode. And that's it in black and white. That's in normal where it it like auto detects uh, and operates a colour killer circuit I think if it detects that there's no colour and that's it in uh, in colour where it forces colour so you can see them these lines appear if that's if I put it in normal and that's it in colour mode. If we look at the scope again, so that's it in colour mode. I put it into normal. It's killing colour. Colour killers operating. And I think with this colour fault, first thing to do is to determine whether it's just affecting play or if it's record as well. So to that end, I've got some colour bars, and I'm going to make a recording. and then I'll play it back 
on a known working video. Might try playing it back on this one as well. See if it gives me colour. Right, well this is it playing it back itself. There's no colour. You see the change, there's some odd little flash of colour there. Odd little flashes. I'll try it on this working machine now. Right, so this is it on a working machine. Yeah, you can see it's just like unlocked. Just horizontal lines of colour, different colours. Like it's changing phase all the time. Because it's affecting both record and playback. Uh, that rules out the APC circuit, which is only active on playback. But it's uh, something else in the, uh, the heterodyne circuit. Uh, this is a block diagram of how the uh, colour circuit works in record mode. Uh, it's easy to do it with record mode because there's less components and we've already established that it's in both record and play. It's not just playback. Um, so what you've got coming in, uh, you have the drum flip-flop signal coming in here and the line sync pulses. Uh, the line sync goes to here to this phase detector. Um, there's a two two and a half megahertz uh, voltage controlled oscillator. This forms like a phase lock loop. That's divided by four, and then divided by forty, which gives the line frequency. And uh, that's compared to the actual line sinks in this phase detector and the error voltage runs this VCO uh, two and a half megahertz. The divided by four uh, two and a half megahertz signal is the output which is 625 kilohertz. This phase shift uh, block what that is is uh, to do with uh, cross torque cancellation. This phase shift block that's controlled by the flip flop signal and that puts back the, uh, the phase of this signal by 90 degrees each line but only for one head that's why it's got that flip flop signal switches it on and off so for one head it's just normal and the other one gets phase shifted uh, so this 625 kilohertz signal goes to this mixer the other input to the mixer is from this uh, 4.435 megahertz crystal oscillator so that's mixed in there and then goes through this bandpass filter to filter out everything so we're only passing this uh, 5.06 megahertz which is the sum of these frequencies and that goes to this other mixer the other input to that mixer is the incoming chroma signal, the 4.43 MHz chroma signal that's mixed in there to give uh, the 626.9 kHz signal that's actually recorded onto the tape it goes through that low pass filter because you'll get a sum and a difference signal when you mix it and you only want the difference signal in this for this which is that so you've got you end up with this 626.9 kHz with the phase locked by the line sinks and it goes to this colour killer circuit um, well it's a transistor which is controlled by this circuit here which uh, gates the colour burst uh, and detects it, it you know it like rectifies it to get a DC level which if that is it, that's compared by this comparator to a threshold and that controls this transistor which operates the colour killer. What we want to do, we check that we've got all the inputs 
the flip flop, the line sync, and we'll follow this through this circuit and just see what's going on basically. See if something's disappearing, or and then we'll be able to test these different frequencies uh, to see if they're correct. Right, this is the E signal, uh, and I'm going to synchronize. Oh, I'm going to trigger scope to that. Right. Oh, have a look at the incoming chroma. I see two or two. Even thirteen. That's how you can see that pretty clearly. Which I expect it to be the um, the flip flop signal, the drum flip flop. I don't want to sync that I don't want to trigger from uh, drum for that. Uh, from the I don't want to trigger from E for that. Pin seven of IC twelve seven. that and line sync pulses so I can trigger from thing for that yep. two and a half megahertz oscillator See if that's running, that's pin 17 of IC208. Who's running? Whether it's right frequency or or out. This line sync, it goes in at pin 10. And then comes out at pin 14 to go to IC208. <coughs> where it goes into the phase detector. Um, hmm. So, that. Some there, but it's very small. Let me see what um, if there's a thing or what that's supposed to look like in the service manual. That's what it's supposed to look like. Seven volts peak to peak. And what is it? It's about half a volt or something. It's not much. Yeah, uh, it's like 0 0.4 volts. I wonder if it's that chip then. I see 207. It's an MN6016A. But you can't get them. Let me check the voltages on it. Like the DC voltages. Right, I'll check the voltages now. Pin 1 should have 6.4 volts. 6.5 that's about right pin 2 3.1 3 3.28 that's right enough uh, pin 3 is connected to earth pin 4 what's that 3.4 3.18 about right pin 5 0 Yep. Pin six three point seven six. Two point nine one. Hmm. It's 
got a, nearly a volt low. Pin seven. Three and a half. Yep, that's right. Pin eight. Three point one. It's three point two. That's right enough. Pin nine. Six point. 6.5 pin 10 0 0.5 0 0.76 mm. pin 11 6.4 6.5 pin 12 0.3 mm. 6.27 volts um, pin 13 0.2 6.41 pin 14 0.8 10.16 pin 15 0.4 yep and pin 6 doesn't say uh, it's not actually connected to all I don't think oh. right 7 voltages around here are wrong uh, this pin 14 is where that line sync should be coming out where we had that half a volt signal it should be like zero and we sort of positive pulses on it what's that connected to? it's connected through a resistor to, uh, to rail and this 13 all this lot were uh, all high weren't it? I wonder what voltage is like on here whether it's this or if it's something external like coming from here I'll check this voltage here at pin 10 of IC204 0.79 0.9 0.9 0.9 0.9 what's it supposed to be? 0.1 so in my area looks as though it might be Possibly that chip. Looks like it might be that IC207. I'll have to see if I can. Uh, what I can do, I, I've got another machine that works. I'll take one out of that and try it in this one for testing. And then I'll have to see if it's possible to get one of them chips. If not, then it might be end at line to this machine. I right, put that new uh, chip in. see what happens and yeah, no, I do it half a volt five yeah so that yeah it does look great right, actually alright let's have a look at the picture Back in colour. So well, that chip. Right, well, I found someone on eBay selling that chip, so I've ordered one. So I'll carry on with this, uh, trying to get this video going again. Um, I've been looking at board and I noticed a few. Capacitors that look like they pass the best, like right, this one here and this one here. And there's a few of them ones looking like that dotted around board, so I think I'm going to replace them before I go further. Right, these are the capacitors that I've replaced. When I measured them, when I took them out, they didn't actually measure that bad, but um, they are leaking, so. I've replaced them. Uh, most of them were actually in chroma circuit, so they're not. They're not uh, they won't have been contributing to this FM problem, but it's best changing them, I think. So this is what it's looking like. Uh, you can see there's like a bit of inversion happening around here. Um, 
in here. You can see that you're sort of losing high frequencies here where it's where you've got white uh, or dark to white transitions like at edge of here. Um, other than that it's not a bad picture. And before I get the scope out, I'll just have a look at what the uh, what's actually happening in the circuit. This is the first part of the FM circuit. Um, signal from the ads comes in here and then there's this little tuning circuit for the frequency response. Um, amplifier. These are switching transistors that uh, switch the signal from one head to the other. It sort of earths one head and uh, allows the other one through based on this square wave which comes from the uh, the drum and there's a balance control to uh, balance the signal from the two heads to get them to the same level uh, then the FM level this is where the colour signal gets taken off um, the emitter follower amp um, equalisation another emitter follower and then to test point seven, uh, which is where it leaves the the preamp board. So these are your, this is your preamp board. Um, so like these are your controls on here. This frequency response, uh, channel balance and level. And it goes on to the YC circuit board. This is on the the YC circuit board this is where the signal comes in from the other board um, and there's an amplifier air pass filter here monochrome and colour switching now I think this might not be there on on this uh, this machine I'm not sure I'd have to double check because I think it's only on early machines what it is what it's for uh, it sort of gets rid of the chroma signal which is below the, the luminance signal um, but it in colour mode and then in, in black and white it allows them lower frequencies through so you sort of get a, a bit better picture quality in, in black and white but I think it, it's removed in later ones so then you've got the dropout compensator circuit but how that works is that the signal when it comes out of here it's fed onto the rest of the circuit and also to a delay line and this dropout detector detects if you know, if there's a dropout if it loses signal then this switch changes this selector to feed in the previous line from the that's been stored in the delay line so that you you get a continuous signal then what happens is there's some limiting it's to, to boost the signal up and, and uh, so get a, a clean signal so what you've got is a high pass filter and a low pass filter the high pass filter passes obviously the the high frequencies which correspond to like peak whites uh, they go to a limiter on their own and then are fed to this mixer amplifier the other input to which is the low pass filtered signal through an emitter follower that goes to the mixer amplifier so the that the high frequencies are already limited and then combined back with the not yet limited low frequencies that signal gets passed on to another limiter so the high frequency signal is limited twice it's limited then combined with the low frequency signal and the whole thing gets limited again and then there's the demodulation happens in this chip as well um, and you've got a couple of controls, limiter balance and carrier balance um, for 
the demodulator. Then there's this filtering and de-emphasis, which that sort of filters out the carrier. And then uh, amplifier switching. This there's bits like this because the this section is used in record as well. Um, and then there's this more monochrome colour switching equalisation and stuff which is uh, to do with this monochrome colour thing um, that deviations for record at test point 6 and then the level playback level because this now is uh, the demodulated luminance that you're dealing with and that carries on to the rest of the circuit which has like uh, what's called aperture correction circuit it's like a sharpener uh, and then it gets combined with colour signal and that's your output composite video um, so there's a few test points to look at but we, and we can follow the signal through the process uh, have a look at different bits see if it if anything looks obviously amiss. Alright, so this is test point four. You should have about 150 millivolts here, uh, according to the service manual. So what we've got? We've got about 75. This is this is the output from the first amplifier. Test point four, one head, and test point five is the other head. Oh, so that same. So that seems a, a bit low. We want to test point seven. That seems a bit low. That though. Um. So it could be that these heads are a bit, aren't they? Uh, test point seven. So we've only got hundred millivolts there as well. And that's supposed to be. Well, service manuals got it at. 0.3 volts. I mean, there is a, an adjustment for for this. So I can try turning that. So I can increase it quite a bit. What's that now? That's about. Uh, point three to point four volts. Um, yeah, about point three volts. But the picture now nah, is absolutely terrible. That's the picture you're getting with it set to that level. Put it back to what it were. About that, weren't it? Right, we're on to the YC board now, and this is the output from the dropout compensator circuit. That's still at about the same level. That seems to be working. This is pin 14 of IC7, which is the input to the first limiter. And the output is pin 6. Uh, which is this that limiter looks to be working this is test point 10 which is the output of the mixing amp where the high frequent the limited high frequency and the not yet limited low frequency get added together uh, and difficult to see anything I'll put it like that and you can see that there's, there's stuff but that's service manual gives that at 1.2 volts so how, what is it it's 
2.8 volts yeah it's about a volt so it's a bit low but I'm not sure if there's an I don't think there's an adjustment for for that but it's it, you know I think that's all right I don't think that that's caused problems and that goes to the input of the next limiter and there's the the uh, demodulation also occurs in the uh, in that chip but there's also an output of uh, the limited signal this is the output of the second limiter and that looks to be doing its job this is the output of the the demodulator uh, this is you can see it's like full of carrier it's the FM demodulation um, <clears throat> so and like the, the these are lines that's a line that's a line this is the sink here and you've got like the the, the porch and uh, then that's the signal you know the the video part um, it's upside down in terms of you know what you would have um, eventually that get then gets filtered to form the actual signal and obviously inverted but the problem's got to be sort of somewhere between the heads and there because it's in FM you can tell by that uh, in the inversion thing that's going on that's an FM problem because after that it's just like low pass filtering and stuff but we saw that the uh, the output from the heads um, from like the first amplifier that were quite low um, it was about a third of what it should have been and then the the output from the second bit of amplification that you know test point seven where you've got the two heads combined um, that were very low and if we turned it up to what it says in the service manual that was it was fully up then that I'd, I had to turn it to max and the picture just went absolutely terrible so I'm sort of suspecting the heads here I've just been examining this head and there's a scratch running the circumference of the drum just here right there between like there's these ridges and between the last two the bottom two there's a scratch that seems to line up with this uh, locator for this V for uh, this V block thing um, but there's a a decent sized gap between the where that V block is and the uh, the drum so I'm not sure exactly what's happened it looks like something's happened at some stage that's caused that scratch but you don't go down to where the heads are now I have got a, uh, a spare head for this type of machine uh, a spare set of heads so I think I might try changing it it's a new, put this new one on and see if it makes uh, you know noticeable see how much difference it makes if I didn't have one I'd try checking other things first but seeing as that one's got that big scratch in it and I have got uh, a spare one I thought I'll change it but I'm just sort of making note of this on this section of this tape I'm getting 100 millivolts at test point 4 and test point 5 which is like the output of the first head amplifier I'll put the new one on and see if that changes it's not too difficult to process uh, replacing these head drums but you do have to just make sure that you put the new ones on the right way around. So you've got a brown side and a red side 
um, they just these are the wires that come up from the lower drum and these are the ones that go into the actual heads so I'll just move that seem to want to melt that yeah. it's not ideal uh, iron tip to be using for this but I don't want to wait for it to cool down to change it Just remember that the uh, the brown on this side and the red on that side. And that just lifts off. The bit of changing these that's a bit awkward is getting these two uh, pairs of wires to go up through the holes in their drum together. So I just straighten them up. You might have to kind of slightly twist them together. Remember I've got red here and brown here. And that slips on like that. And that lines up with them holes. I'll put screws in first. Right, so I'll put the screws in first. Separate these wires out. I put a dab of fresh solder on there. Make sure it takes easily.
you want to do that quite quickly um, so in a way it is handy having the, the big iron tip because it'll heat that up nice and quick so you're not lingering on it and you end up so if you do that you end up uh, with this thingy coming back this insulation Right, and there we are. That's the new head fitted. We'll see what it's like with these new heads, see if it's made a difference. Well, this is test point seven. This is test point four. It's about the same as where it was on the other one. That's 100 millivolts. Um, I'll try adjusting the FM level, see what happens. I'll say it's 300 millivolts there. It's not causing black streaking inversion on the screen. Well, I'm not on that test uh, card bit of tape, so I'll wind it back to that. So this is it at that level. Uh, turn it up to 300 millivolts like I did with the other one. Gets a lot worse. And there's actually no point at which it doesn't have that inversion going back and forth with, uh, you know, what do you call it? That kind of suggests to me that it is perhaps not the heads so i'll have to go through try going through the alignment procedure i suppose whether to do it with these heads or them other heads i don't know i think i'll put the original heads back on and try it with them try just aligning everything or at least checking to see if if things are sort of out of alignment the FM uh, adjustments, I mean. Uh, seeing as I didn't get any sort of increasing output or anything with our new heads, I've put the original ones back on and I'm going to see if I can do the adjustments, uh, just set up the FM circuit adjustments and uh, see if I can get picture any better. So there's uh, limit of balance one, which is the DC offset level for the first limiter. In service manual it tells you to view waveform on a scope and to, to get it so that there's no carrier visible but it's, it's difficult to do that because it's a bit fuzzy on the scope but you can do it uh, you can sort of get it you can get it set up just by like looking at the screen and doing it. You need a, a test card like this and to just get it so you're minimising these black uh, inversion bits on it. Oh, this is what happens when you adjust it. I've misadjusted tracking. Can help you. So, 
helps if your tape's not damaged. That's the limited balance one, you can always come back to it. Right, next adjustment, it's done with colour bar tape. Uh, there's two that you adjust together, limited balance two and carrier balance. Um, and this is the for the second limiter and like demodulator. So you're sculpting test point 11 which is the FM modulator output. And what you're trying to do is like get these edges so that there's no sort of blurring because if I misadjust this um, you can see there's sort of two waveforms <coughs> laid on top of each other and you have to line them up exactly so that these edges are nice and sharp Mainly like around the, this is sink tip, and this is peak white. It's mainly around them that you you need it to be precise. Think that that looks good. I've got a fresh recording at test card. I'm gonna set the FM level to what it says in uh, the service manual, and see how it is, and then I'll see if I need to. Sort of wind it back. What's it at a minute? So sort of like 100 millivolts. That's 150. That's at about 300. You can see. I'm getting uh, this like inversion and fringing stuff. So if I reduce this, it's a point where there's no none of that inversion. That looks alright. See that's at 150 millivolts again there, which is what it were at originally. Then I'll just recheck that uh, limiter balance to and carrier balance adjustment just to make sure it's still uh, looking alright with that FM level setting. That looks bang on now, with that FM level set as it is. And you can see it's nice and bright at these edges. And that is just a perfect line. But I think that is set up pretty much spot on. And it looks good. I'm happy with it. I think that's that video recorder is now working properly. I'm pleased with that. I'll put it back together now. I'll try making a recording on it. Because I haven't recorded out. Or uh, 
and check that recording's working properly. Right, well, I've made a recording of that task card with uh, an alternating 1 and 5 kilohertz tone. So I'll play it back. That looks pretty good to me. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Well, I'm pretty happy with that. Um, I'll put it back together and uh, these will need going back on. There's this. Uh, like the the adhesive has like lost its stickiness over time. Uh, that's the front panel and the like trim for the top of the cassette compartment. So I'll have to find something to stick them back on. But other than that, I think that machine's. Pretty much good.